Here once again this year, welcome to the 12th Taishin Summit, themed upon a building a community of shared future. In the last one year, economies throughout the world are working very hard to rebound back to a normal level. So against this backdrop, we feel that we're in a defining moment with both the COVID-19 pandemic and economic challenges. So we're faced with uncertainties. But it's exactly why we realize the significance of building a community of shared future. So against this backdrop, at this defining moment, it is critical for us to talk with each other and share our thoughts. And that's why we create this theme of this year's Taishin Summit. The sixth plenary session of the 19th CPC just concluded, which summarized what we have done here in China. And it also set up new targets for the future. In this year's Taishin Summit, we're going to, again, talk about some of the most important issues all around the world. Now, the meeting is also high level, like what we did in the previous years, and we are very delighted to have some of the VIPs across the world. So upon the Chinese economy, new economy, global economy, uh, health management, carbon emission, etc., we're going to share views. So I would like to, with that, invite Madame Hu Shuli, publisher of Caixin Media, to present to us an opening remark. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm honored to present to you an opening remark. And later on, Wang Shuo will be giving you um, also another opening remark. So ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. I'm honored to meet with you online and offline. In this 12th Caixin Summit, the world nowadays is faced with unprecedented challenges. Things like climate change, COVID-19, pandemic, poverty, etc. are still with us. The sixth plenary session of the 19th CPC just concluded. Beijing 2022 is also going to be organized next year. Now, the mitigation of the COVID-19 pandemic is getting increasingly normalized. So how can we make sure that domestic and international circulations are in line with each other. Now, this is a huge challenge for us. Caixin Summit is a major event in the field of economic development here in China. Now, we started preparing this year's summit from the second half of this year. We would like to make it more innovative and would like to include more topics and more speakers so as to live up to the existing challenges. And that's why we decided to open up another plenary session outside of Beijing so that we'll be, make we'll be able to make sure that friends both online and offline can share with us their thoughts. So the opening ceremony today, as you can see, actually is organized both in Beijing and in Singapore. And next month in Shenzhen, we're also going to organize another session, another Great Bay Area session. So once again, for those who are interested in joining the Caixin Summit, you will be able to pick up any time uh, which is suitable for you. This year marks the 12th anniversary of the establishment of Caixin Media. We've been dedicating to build ourselves to one of the best media agencies here in China via high quality, high value paid service. Our paid service is increasing and developing rapidly. We're actually 
the only Chinese agency list on the IFIPP. Now, in the previous years, our rank actually was about 10th. But in the first half of this year, we moved to number 9 on the list. And so far, we already have about 700,000 paid uh, users, up by 20%. This year's Taishin Summit is also going to be focusing on being practical and professional. So we're going to talk about the problems still remaining unaddressed and hidden by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the challenges. I do look forward to the ideas shared to be shared by our VIPs. Now, I would like to announce the opening of this year's Taishin Summit. And with that, I'd like to invite Wang Shuo, Editor-in-Chief of Taishin Media, to present to you an opening remark. Welcome. Thank you very much, madam. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Wang Shuo, the Editor-in-Chief of Taishin Media. Welcome to attend this year's Taishin Summit. Every time this year, we'll be gathering here. Now, this year, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, most of you are online. But the things we're going to talk about remain professional and insightful. The theme of this year's Taishin Summit is building a community of shared future. In order to build this community of shared future, we need to find the greatest common divisor so that we'll be able to find a common background. And on that basis, we can grow together. A community of shared future is supported by the greatest common divisor, and its goal is to achieve a win-win result. It doesn't mean that one side wins for two times or that both sides will wane at exactly the same proportion, but it means that every side will become a better one or a better self. So we want to improve ourselves, and we don't have to improve ourselves at the cost of others decreasing themselves' benefits. So against this backdrop, I believe that win-win is the core of building a community of shared future. On the other hand, however, if the development of one site is at the cost of the underdevelopment of another, this kind of zero-sum game will not be the choice we want. We need to find the greatest common divisor because all of us would want to improve ourselves so that this community of shared future will become a better one as a whole. So that is my view towards this theme. I would like to thank once again all of our speakers. I believe that with your excellent thoughts, this year's Taishin Summit will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wan, for your speech. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to the keynote speech session. Now, every year, we actually are very delighted to have um, the VIPs in the entire world. Actually, this year, we are delighted to have two Nobel Prize winners. Uh, one will be giving speech tomorrow. So the other one is Mr. Jean Tohol, the 2014 Nobel Prize winner of economics. Welcome. Welcome to this 12th Kaishin Summit. My name is Jean Tirol. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Toulouse, and I'm delighted to be invited to give this uh, lecture. The lecture will be on how to foster the common good. Uh, the plan for this lecture will be to first define the common good. We need to know what the common good is about and what its implications are. And then I will move on to say, well, how do you achieve this common good? Contracts, regulation, or civil society? And then I will come to the notion of social responsibility and these ESG criteria and their challenges. 
But the first question, of course, is what is a common good? So the common good um, comes from the fact that there are many situations in which the interest of consumers, of firms, of governments, of countries diverge from the general interest. So for example, we as consumers, we may pollute too much, we may drive too fast, we may refuse to be vaccinated or take too much antibiotics. The firms may take too much risk, they may jeopardize the jobs of their workers or the savings of their investors, or maybe public finances if there is taxpayer money involved. They may abuse their monopoly power, they may misrepresent their products. The state may engage in excessive debt. It may tolerate inequality, it may create financial crisis, it may deprive its citizens of their freedom. The countries may put their country first. So put the, the national interest over the interest of the world. And we have seen that very often with global warming, with trade wars, with fiscal competitions, for example. What is a common feature of all those uh, situations? The common feature is that the individual interest trumps the general interest. The ambition of economics for the common good is to align the actor's interest with the general interest. And there are two instruments to do that. The first instrument is persuasion. So we want to encourage citizens, for example, to engage in good behavior, corporate social responsibility for firms. To that purpose, we may design non-based interventions, which means that we try to boost awareness about the consequences of selfishness. But of course, there are limits to what can be done. Remember that the global warming, for example, has been discussed for 30 years almost, since the Rio 1992 summit, and very little has been done, and now we are against the wall. Um, so we need incentives, not only persuasion, we need incentives so as to align the general interest uh, with the uh, individual interest. But what is a common good? The common good can be defined through a thought experiment. This thought experiment has been designed by philosophers over the centuries and it's called the veil of ignorance. It's a very, very simple thought experiment. So, Imagine that you are not born yet. So you don't know whether you'll be a man or a woman, a Han or an ethnic minority, or you are born in a rich family or a poor family, or if you are French or Chinese, or maybe you know what, what kind of education you will get, what kind of genes you will get. Will you, will you have a cancer or no cancer? Um, that's the kind of situation that you want to consider and ask yourself. A very simple question. In what kind of society would I like to live in? And the answer to this question is going to define the common good. Now, you have to think a little bit, a few caveats. First, it's not a la-la land. Um, incentives matter. So we all, whether we are government, uh, a researcher, an unemployed, a firm, or whatever, or country, we also stand for our own self-interest. We are, we are willing to do the good, but you know, we also defend our own interests. So we need incentives. And remember the Soviet Union, at the start they believed in the, uh, the new man, the Soviet new man, uh, will, will, will devote selflessly uh, to the common good. And of course that was a failure because they forgot about incentive and that ended up with a big economic failure, an environmental failure, a failure in terms of freedom, a failure in terms of everything. And we need to adopt a long-term vision and we should not prejudge instruments. So this sort of experiment is it's actually hard because we are to perform because we actually have a position in society. I'm French, I'm a man, I've, of this and that, of my own political opinion and so on. It's very hard for me to think about what I would like to get behind the veil of ignorance. But still there are a number of things I can derive from that. 
So for example, economic efficiency. We want economic efficiency because we want well-being. We want purchasing power. We want to be able to finance an education and health system. So we need an efficiency-oriented legal framework, for example. We need to fight abuses of dominant positions of firms. We need to regulate banks and so on and so forth. So economic efficiency. But then we need a set of insurance mechanisms. So beyond of, of the veil of ignorance, you know, we may be born in a poor family, we may be born in a rich family, but we should be getting the same education, a good education for all, that equality of chances. We want to have health insurance, so you could be born with a bad health or good health, you know, and you don't know in advance, so you need insurance against a bad health. We need to correct other inequalities, like gender inequality, like income inequality, and we need protection against life mishaps more generally. And finally, we need societal reg regulation. So we need tolerance, tolerance because you don't know when you are born which religion you want to adopt or no religion at all, against your ethnicity, against sexual orientation, against everything. We want tolerance. So the state here is seen as a fixer of market failures. But what if the state also fails? And that's going to be the next question because it's going to bring us to the notion of uh, social responsibility. So let's talk about social responsibility. And let's start with something which is very bizarre, which is the shareholder value oddity. So most of the firms in the world are run by their shareholders, maybe by debt holders if there's distress, but by and large, it's an investor-owned corporation. I mean, of course, there are other types of corporation like not-for-profit and so on, but you know, by and large, the main form of corporation is a shareholder-owned corporation. The rationale for that is that the investors, they want to secure a return on their investment because they won't finance a firm if they are not sure they get, they get a return. And one way of getting a return is to keep control over the management. That's correct, but at the same time, the stakeholders, the other people who have a stake in the firm also are affected by the decision. So you have in mind the workers, the suppliers, the communities where the firm is located, the polluters if there's pollution and so on. So they are what economists call basic decision externalities. The big question then is why do you get so many uh, shareholder owned corporation. And also Friedman's uh, remark, a very fa famous remark in which he says, the only social responsibility of business is to maximize profit. Fine to maximize profit, except that there are anxieties on shareholders. Now, there are two reactions to anxieties. The first reaction is due to say, Ronald Cause with another Nobel laureate, and he said, we should write contracts. We should write contracts which are going to insulate the stakeholders from the decisions of, of management and, and the shareholders. And there are ways which to do that, and they are used to some extent. So for example, a nominal fixed claim. So a fixed wage for workers, a severance pay when the worker is, is, is fired. Um, for creators, often it's a fixed, uh, fixed claim as well, plus maybe some collateral or priority ranking in case of, of bankruptcy. The other way of protecting stakeholders is planning's exit option in case they are unhappy with the firm. So for example, for workers that might be general training, flexible labor market and so on. At the same time, there is only so much that the contract can achieve. Contracts are very imperfect. There are collective action plans as well. So for example, in climate change, we are 7 billion uh, people in the world. We cannot just all write contracts. Same thing for most public policies like competition policies, safety of, of food, privacy, and so on. We need to have some collective action. 
And there are some other failures of the cause uh, logic as well. So for example, we might want to build a nuisance an, an entity in order to then bargaining its withdrawal. It's a little bit technical, I'm sorry, but you know, contracts have their failures. So if contracts have their failures, you need government. And in a sense, that's a vision which in the West has existed for basically two centuries since Adam Smith. And I would say also Pigou. So the Chevrolet value approach to society should be organized so that it protects stakeholders. So you get the invisible end of the market, which is going to harness the pursuit of self-interest to the pursuit of efficiency. At the same time, you will have the state, which is going to do two things. The first is to correct market failures, which are due to externalities. So for example, when there is pollution, that's a form of externalities, you hurt somebody else or internalities, and internality is basically when people fail to stand for their own best interests. So for example, they might overconsume drugs or not save enough because they are impatient, they are impulsive. That's one thing. Asymmetric information is another market failure. That's why we have, for example, pro consumer protection or investor protection. And then there is another type of market failure, which is inequality. So behind the field of ignorance, there is no reason why a market should deliver equality of chances, equal, you know, limited inequality in terms of income and wealth. And that's where Pigou comes in and, and many other authors. So basically, contracts don't suffice, you also need regulation. Now, why do we have a social responsibility as individuals, as corporations? Well, in a sense, that's because there is a double failure, failure of the market and failure of the government. The government may fail for multiple reasons. It may fail because it's captured by lobbies and other interest group, because the rulers have a quest for personal power, because the governments may pander to electorates, prejudices and misunderstanding, because bad things happen in the other jurisdiction. So for example, child labor, um, you know, it may not be in your own country, it may be in another country. Oh, and that's something you cannot also discipline through regulation anyway. You know, small things, everyday things, you need social norms to substitute for regulation. And because the government also fails, it's not only the market that fails, we have some social responsibility. And that brings me through three views on corporate social responsibility. The first view I will call win-win. Doing well by doing good. Now, the first time you hear about doing well by doing good, you smile. You smile because you say, who is crazy enough to actually want to lose money and at the same time do bad things? That sounds strange, right? There's a better interpretation of that. The interpretation is in terms of short term versus long term. So there are some corporations, like we have seen the financial crisis with banks, who actually privilege the short term over the long term of the corporation and the long term of society. For example, they may misrepresent their income sheet, their balance sheet, or they may take too much risk. Why? Because they want to cash in a short-term bonus or they want fame or they want to keep their job. Now, in that case, they work against both the interests of the corporation, the long-term interest, and also the interests of society. Because interests of society is simply because, you know, the, 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 the workers in the firm or the bank may lose their job the, the, the taxpayer may have to, to bail out the bank, for example. So there are a bunch of things that are going to go wrong. So according to this view, corporate social responsibility, CSR, is about taking a long-term view of maximizing 
in Delta Bowl profit. And there is a correlation, as I said, because that also protects third parties like the worker or the environment at the same time as protecting shareholders. So the implication of that is that we should intervene as investors, for example, to force the firms and the managers actually to take a long-term view. And this is just profit maximization, except it's long-term profit maximization. Second view on uh, corporate social responsibility is what I would call delegated philanthropy. The, the firm as a channel for the expression of citizen values. So for example, as a consumer, I'm willing to pay my coffee a little bit more if this is coffee produced in fair trade. So that means that basically um, the workers in the, in the poor country who produce a coffee are paid a little bit more. Same thing as an investor, I'm willing to get a slightly lower return uh, if you know, my money goes to financing uh, clean, clean firms and, and ethical firms. And workers are willing to, pay, to be paying le paid less if they work for an NGO. But of course, it's profit maximization again, because then the firm actually um, does philanthropy, but on behalf of the consumer, and is going to uh, pass through the extra costs into the price. So, you know, Starbucks will buy fair trade coffee, but at the same time, will charge more for its coffee. It's again profit maximization. And the third item, the third possible view on CSR is real philanthropy of the firm where the firm actually loses money to do good. Actually, there is some opposition to that, uh, not always, fortunately, but there is opposition from the left and the right side of the political spectrum. Friedman on the right side of the political spectrum actually is very much against uh, this because he says this is a government, this, this is shareholder money and there is no reason why a manager should have the right to spend money that doesn't belong to him or her. So basically the idea is that the manager can actually do philanthropy, but with his own money. Robert Reich, uh, who is on the left side of the spectrum, of the political spectrum, says, no, no, philanthropy and public policy is actually the work of government, not of private firms. Let me conclude with um, three informational challenges. It's actually hard to design ESG criteria, okay? So environmental, societal, and government governance criteria. The first thing is that you have to collect data and collect data along the supply chain. So for example, I would like to know how much this firm I'm buying from pollutes, how much CO2 it emits. But then I have to look at the entire value chain where you know, the subcontractor and the subcontractor, subcontractor are also going to pollute and I have to know how much they've polluted. Then there is data aggregation. So uh, let me come back to Starbucks, for example. Starbucks does nice, nice thing buying fair trade coffee, but at the same time is going to um, optimize on taxes and not pay taxes very much in Europe, for example. So how do you weigh those, this good and the bad? Uh, you know, you need weights uh, to actually compute how good a firm is. Then the valuation is complex. So how do you know an action is good for society or not? So take greenhouse gases, for example. So as an investor, I can invest in a firm which invests in green projects. But of course, if the project will have taken place for whatever reason, for example, it already, it already exists, or maybe it's heavily subsidized by the government and therefore it's going to exist anyway, then if I invest in it, I'm not going to change anything. So in principle, the project should be additional, meaning that it should take place it should not have taken place without my financing it. And that's very hard to know. 
we, you know, it's very, very hard. We, we want to avoid windfall profits. And then we need to, staying with carbon, we need to compute the savings in terms of, uh, of, of tons of carbon, but also how valuable this is. So you, look, you have to look at all the future prices of carbon, which by the way, is way too small right now. We need a carbon price worldwide and a decent carbon price. And we are very far from it at this stage. And then we need, we need to more generally think about what is socially responsible. I'm not going to develop that, but what we care about is impact, not posture. We want to have an impact and make this world a better place. So let me conclude here with those, with those notes and a few concluding remarks. We still face the challenges that existed pre-COVID, um, but we also have opportunities. AI, genetics, and so on are amazing opportunities. We should become much wealthier and much healthier in the, in the future. But at the same time, we also have all the societal challenges that were not solved uh, prior to COVID. Global warming, the future of labor, multilateralism, which is very important. We are not going to survive in this world if the countries don't work together. Inequality, regulation, debt, and so on. The question people often ask is, what with COVID? Is this going to be a catalyst, catalyst for change? So finally, we become aware that we are fragile and our world is a fragile place? Or is that going to be an echo chamber for our weaknesses? Of course, I prefer the former. And we need to think more about using economics and other social sciences and the common deciphering key is a common good. What kind of society would like to live in if we were behind the fate of ignorance? Thank you so much again for your invitation. Uh, I wish you a very, very successful 12 Kaishin Summit. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for your wonderful keynote speech. Now we are going to have the next keynote dialogue. And just like Shuri mentioned, we continue the Beijing-Singapore connection between two cities, uh, one city and one country. Now I'd like to over to our colleague, our editor, Madam Li Xing, chief editor in Singapore, and who is going to invite guests from Singapore. And we are going to have the next session. Just now, Zhong talked about the market power and its relation to the government regulation. In 2014, he was given Nobel Prize because of the theory. And uh, now I'd like to over to Li Xin. Hello, Xiaoxuan, can you hear from me? Yes, you can go ahead, okay. Dear audience in Beijing and uh, China, my name is Li Xing. I'm now in the uh, Singapore site of uh, Caixin Summit. Next session will be in.